did the Senate hit the bonding sweet spot? And concrete support for a Viking stadium we discuss in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. The highly anticipated bonding bills came to the forefront in both the House and Senate this week. The House bill totals less than $300 million. The Senate's bill totals $496 million. The bills in both bodies come in significantly less than the governor's proposed $775 million capital investment proposal. Senator Dave Senjum carries the bill. He defends the projects and added a unique element to the Senate's plan. You brought up in committee that there are a couple of unique components to this year's package. What are those? Yes, uh, this year, Julie, we put a couple of things in the bonding bill uh, to have some discussion, hopefully uh, maybe be even enacted as we go forward uh, through the conference committee. One, one relates to you know jobs and job creation. Okay, we, we always have bonding bills, uh, seemingly, and we always say they're great job producers. And, and I'm not going to suggest that uh, they don't produce jobs. But the, uh, the language within this year's bill says, okay, let's start tracking jobs. Let's have reports back how many jobs were produced, uh, you know, a little bit about salary and things like that. So we have some better idea as to what, frankly, quantifiably, uh, is the job creation uh, ability of a bonding bill. So we'll hopefully get that put together and, uh, and uh, going forward, we'll have some better idea of the, the value of of bonding to job production. The other one has to do, and it's somewhat unique, we have, we have within the bonding bill other examples right now, for instance, uh, uh, having to do with the uh, sewer and water projects. We don't fund the sewer and water project, for instance, specifically for a small town. We put them in what we call the uh, Public Finance Authority has a fund, and we will fund that fund, and the Public uh, Finance Authority then, or Public Facilities Authority, then will decide on whether or not it's uh, Bawabic or whether or not it's Walnut Grove in terms of, of needing assistance from the state and we'll base that on need and, and other features. So uh, what we suggest is we're going to take all the local bonding projects, put them into a like fund, deed would administrate it, and they will then, based on some criteria, attempt to adjudge which project is meritorious over other projects and take kind of the politics, if you will, out of the bonding bill. Well, let's talk a little bit about the actual bill. It totals $496 million. What mm -hmm. do you like best? Oh, uh, be honest with you, uh, I think uh, the lead project in the bill has to do with the uh, expansion of the Cancer Research Center at the Hormel Institute. may surprise people, but it's a magnificent organization that does wonderful work. Uh, they're going to double their facility over there. The Hormel Foundation is going to take care of paying half of that uh, or the other half, and it's a magnificent project, and I think as we traveled around the state of Minnesota, I think that really was the, the, the highlight project of all that we looked at. Given that the projects, <clears throat> excuse me, given the projects that made it into the bill and those that were excluded, such as the St. Paul Saints Ballpark, Minority Leader Tom Bach stated in a news release this week that, quote, the bonding bill should not have a partisan tone of bringing home the bacon. The focus should be on making investments that leave a better Minnesota for future generations. In your opinion, does your bill have a partisan tone to oh, it? Oh, for goodness sakes, don't. Uh, uh, not. Uh, that is not the case at all. It, uh, tell you what, we, you know, put the bill together, looking at both sides, it, 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 it's got to have a bipartisan approach because it takes 41 votes to, to pass. So, uh, in, in that sense, you have to reach out and involve your, your, in our case, DFL colleagues. We certainly did that. Uh, it's not at all a partisan bill. I will assure anybody uh, uh, that that is uh, not the case. It's a bipartisan bill, and it was crafted in that fashion and worked with uh, uh, the minority caucus to, to put it together. Well, somebody who is obviously disappointed is Senator yeah. Sandy Pappas. She does join us later yeah. in the program, and she's disappointed again that the St. Paul Saints ballpark is excluded from the bill and the Minsky or the U of M appropriations as well. Is there wiggle room in these areas for you as this um, as this bill goes through the process through conference committee? Well there, there, there more than likely will be uh, although it, it might wiggle down instead of up uh, uh, honestly because uh, it uh, it's a matter that the house has a uh, 280 million dollar bill this is a 496 million dollar bill and uh, there will be wiggle room, but uh, you know, to make all these projects work within the framework of whatever that final number is is going to be difficult. Uh, uh, and I would just say, 
you know, from the standpoint of the St. Paul Saints, uh, they have been magnificent in terms of advocating for their project. It's been around for two years. We've had projects on the list that have been here for five or six years. Uh, to some extent, there is a, a kind of a wait your time phenomena that goes on here, and, uh, and that's just the way it has to be. There's so much available money, and we've got to look at each of them and try to craft this bill as well as we can, understanding that uh, uh, there is a, a wait in line phenomena that we have. And the Senate bill, from a dollar amount standpoint, comes in virtually in the middle of what the governor yeah. proposes and what the House proposes. So let's begin with the House as you go into conference committee. When you go into conference sure. committee, would you go as low as $300 million? I, uh, we will, I, I will doubt that we would probably want to go that low. Uh, I, I, I think we have to be able to, you know, pass the bill. That's the secret. You have to, you have to make it low enough uh, to certainly uh, appeal to one side and certainly high enough to appeal to the other side. And you look for, if you will, the sweet spot. And uh, we believed, at least in, in, on the Senate side, that the sweet spot was at about, you know, uh, just short of $500 million. And, uh, and that matches up, by the way, to a $497 million bill that was uh, put into place last July of 2011 uh, and making then the total bill uh, uh, a little less than a billion dollars, which is somewhat typical of a bonding biennium for the state of Minnesota. You've been quoted saying this is the right bill at the right time, but given the low interest rates at this time, is there room for you to go up closer to the governor's number? Well, you have to just acknowledge that you know bonding is not free. It, uh, there is a debt service associated with it, and you have to recognize that. And and so, uh, by no means are uh, we out of the woods on a budgetary basis at this point. Uh, the bonding bill was based on a forecast which said we could we could spend under the forecast up to 775 million dollars, uh, as the governor did. Uh, we're a little under that, uh, but I think we feeling we're feeling at least on our side that. That we ought to be under it, that we that we shouldn't reach for the stars necessarily, that we ought to be somewhat reserved and looking towards the future and, and possible deficits. Senator, are you proud of the bill as it stands? I'm, I'm happy. You know, you're never proud of anything. Well, maybe you are. I, I don't know, but uh, but what you do is try to again find a put together a bill that uh, will generally uh, speaking. Uh, get support on, on both sides and it will pass. I think it's important for a bonding bill to pass this year and that was the objective and as we fine-tuned this thing uh, looking at uh, all the net needs of Minnesota, and I, I, will, I will say a lot of higher education needs, a lot of uh, uh, wastewater infrastructure needs, certainly a lot of flood control needs, uh, uh, a lot of uh, roads and bridges needs. There's a, there's a fundamentally, an L, you know, it's, it's a basic bill essentially. Uh, so as you look at those fundamental needs that we have, I think it's well put together and hopefully we'll get good support. Did you present a bill that will get the we, votes? Pardon me? Did you present a bill that you expect to oh, get the, uh, the well, votes? Well, uh, I do have uh, Senator Langston on the other side that uh, has, has moved the bill in two committees now so and has signed on to the bill. So that's always a good sign that the ranking uh, Democrat in this case is, uh, is okay with it. Uh, given the fact that he has uh, dissenters within his own caucus that uh, are not necessarily in love with this bill, he nonetheless, I think, recognizes it's a, it's a good middle ground and we can work with it. Okay, Mr. Chair of the Capital Investment Committee and Majority Leader Dave Sanjum, thank you for joining us today. We certainly appreciate it. Julie, thank you so much. Senator Sandy Pappas expressed some concerns with the bonding bill. She's here to discuss those now. Senator, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me on again, Julie. When Senator Senjum detailed his bill in the Capital Investment Committee, you did have some concerns, including the exclusion of the St. Paul Saints ballpark. What other concerns do you have with the overall bill? Julie, it's the worst bonding bill I've seen in over 20 years. I mean, it is so inadequate. Uh, when you're trying to fit the important infrastructure needs of the state into a $500 million container, you just can't get everything. So it looked to me like they made choices to favor their members over our members, the Republicans over the Democrats. And that's not been our tradition in the Senate.
Senate. Tradition has been to have a balanced bill. It also very much favors outstate Minnesota, rural Minnesota, as opposed to the metro area. And that's not been our tradition in the bonding bill. We want to be equal because you've got to get a supermajority to get this bill passed. And you need to be fair to everybody in the state. Just to be more clear, when you say inadequate, are you referencing the projects or the dollar amount or both? Both. Both. $500 million is not an, an adequate bonding bill. Um, you just can't meet the infrastructure needs of the state with that. And yet the house is considerably less. Oh, the house is worse. <laughs> yeah, I was just at a meeting this morning with uh, Chancellor Rosenstone from Minsky, and he was talking about all the, all the STEM projects that were funded in the Senate bill that weren't funded in the House bill. The Senate bill does come in, though, higher than the governor with its Minsky appropriations, but roughly half of the governor for the University of Minnesota. So as former chair of the Higher Ed Committee, what would you have liked to have seen for higher ed? Well, we've always tried to keep parity between the university and Minsky. Even though Minsky has more campuses and serves more students, the university has an important um, research function. And also, they have very old buildings that often are very expensive if we want to preserve those buildings or even building new ones. And you know, the physics building, laboratory buildings are very expensive to build. But to not do the utility plant, uh, the steam plant at the University of Minnesota, that's a very important HEPA project for $54 million. It's not a glamorous project, but it really needs to be done. That is inexcusable. So what do you think it would take to make a good bill? What would you like to see in well, addition I, I to Well, I think you'd there? need a billion dollars, basically, to make a good bill, to be really able to satisfy um, the needs of the state. And we actually, in terms of our own internal rules about how much um, how much we want our bond payments to be every year, we actually have the capacity to do $2 billion. Interest rates are low, 2% right now. It's a good time to bond. It puts a lot of people to work and satisfies those infrastructure needs. And now the GOP would argue that if you factor in last year's bonding bill, we did hit the billion dollar mark or close to it. Well, th it, we're just playing catch up because last year was a little bigger for a non-bonding year, but the year before that was smaller and had a lot of vetoed projects. So you have a lot of pent-up needs here. You, you have to have some certainty in the system. So when you get on the Minsk list, you have to know within a few years you're going to be able to have your building funded. And the same thing, if you get on the list, if you're a St. Paul project or a Minneapolis project or a Mankato project, you know, you can't leave people hanging out there. People raise private matching dollars. Those dollars can go away if the state doesn't keep up its end. And um, students graduate, you know. I mean, and we're not, we, we, we don't have the lab facilities to serve the students that are there, and they graduate with an inadequate education. I want to ask you about a provision that's in this year's bill that typically is not, and that is having MMB actually quantify the number of jobs that come from bonding bills. What do you think of that provision that's in the Senate bill? I think it's fine. I mean, I think we've always done that calculation anyway because we want to show that there's construction jobs. But, you know, when you fund a higher ed facility, you really get a double whammy. You uh, triple, actually. You fund construction jobs during the course of the project. You're educating the future workforce. And you're expanding your programmatic offerings, so you're hiring more professors and more support staff to educate those, te those students. Senator Senjum has stated that the bill, as it stands, has some wiggle room. That really it opens the door to future conversations, particularly with the House, and then later down the road with the governor. Do you see a lot of wiggle room between the House and the Senate in particular, and then this whole three-way conversation? Well, I'm not sure how that's going to t take place in the short time we have left in this session. Um, and the governor typically doesn't get to weigh in unless he vetoes the bill. And why do we have to go through that game? Why can't they listen to the governor now while they're in the... Um, the process of communicating with each other, the House and the Senate. I mean, obviously the governor is going to be concerned that our core cities have not had their top priority funded. Um, you know, we, uh, they need to understand that all arts and culture is really important to our cities. So we need the regional ballpark funded. Minneapolis needs the, um, needs the, the sculpture garden. That's a very top site in terms of tourism. And uh, the parks, metro parks, that's another gap. Another big gap is the, uh, the tunnel under University Avenue. That's a timing issue. The, the bonding bill, maybe it's the newness of the staff, but they don't seem to have a sense of 
the timing. Federal match is another issue. The timing issue is important with the tunnel before light rail goes in on University Avenue. And federal match that came up in the meeting is that, hey, you know, we're leaving all these federal dollars on the table. It's a five to one match, five federal dollars for every one dollar we put in. Why would we do that? We should maximize that. Um, so there's a lot of problems with that bill. Okay, my last question for you is when the when the bill was unveiled in the Capital Investment Committee, Minority Leader Tom Bach stated in a news release that bonding bills should not have a partisan tone of bringing home the bacon. The focus should be on making an investment that leaves a better Minnesota for future generations. The GOP contends that this does. This looks ahead. There's a lot of flood mitigation money in it. What do you think? Is it partisan or not? Well, um, it, you can say it's partisan, or you can say it's geographic, or whatever, but it does not meet the needs of the entire state fairly. So why is St. Paul left out of the picture? Why is Minneapolis left out of the picture? Why are two convention centers funded, uh, uh, St. Cloud and Rochester, and not Mankato? Although, to be fair, Mankato has a placeholder in it. Now, now it does. Now it does. But take. that was a big argument in the bonding committee about having a placeholder. But it shouldn't even have a placeholder. If you're going to do a, you know, you just have to be fair. Unless you have a kind of a pecking order, uh, like Minsky does, of uh, convention centers. Once we went down that road of helping um, these regional centers with their convention centers, then you have to continue with it. And we're just about out of time, but I do have one last question. The House does have a St. Paul St. Paul Park allocated in its bill. The governor is asking for it as well. Are you optimistic? Um, I am optimistic. The St. Paul Regional Ballpark has had bipartisan support, strong support from the chamber, strong support from labor. I mean, I've never seen a project that has been is so universally popular. That's why it's really a mystery to me why it's not in the bonding bill. Okay. On those words, Senator Pappas, thanks for joining us today. Thanks. These Minnesotans flooded to the Capitol to convey their message loud and clear. Vote no in November to the constitutional amendment to define marriage as a union between one man and one woman. We find ourselves standing up here today at the Capitol, as Monica Meyer from out front likes to say, living lives of amazing vitality, saying to our state legislators, we are part of the Minnesota family. With the revelations coming out of Maine, we know that our opponents are not interested in any sort of a civil discussion as they claimed when they passed this thing last year. They're all about driving wedges, in their own words, wedges between communities, importing highly paid professional provocateurs. This is not an I have as a dream speech. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't presume. And I did have a dream that Minnesota would be the first state in the nation to reject this kind of thing. After eight years in the Senate and six in the House, Senator Chris Gerlach has opted not to seek re-election. We sat down with him to get the inside perspective on why he's leaving public office. What made you decide that now's the time to step away? Uh, well, I think clearly the biggest reason is demands with family and business. Just the, the personal struggle that all legislators uh, uh, go with. I mean, the tension between balancing that, it's, it's very difficult to do. My kids are now ages 10 and 8. Uh, of course, they weren't even born when I was first elected. This is all they know. And they're getting into that real parent intensive phase, as well as just the need to uh, uh, put all my efforts into a business and make some money, take care of my family. And 14 years was long enough, so it just, you know when it's time. You just know when it's time. So what are the things that you take from here that you're going to bring back with you into your personal life? Oh, I, I think that clearly the, the number one thing, it's not any policy area, it's not any technical knowledge, it's uh, working with people. There's no question about it. There is no greater laboratory for understanding people, uh, motivations and uh, uh, desires and, and competing interests than the legislature, than this type of environment. And having juggled that for 14 years, I, I feel like uh, I, I could probably uh, you know, test out of becoming a licensed therapist, I think, <laughs> from all the help we've had to give to people and advice and coaching and, and everything else. But uh, that's probably it, just, just working with people. You touched briefly on the word policy, so let's talk a little bit about policy and perhaps some of the legislation that you're most proud of. 
Oh, uh, going over the years, I, I think just from a high altitude, of course, I, I ran for office uh, under the uh, um, this notion of, of limited government, lower taxes, uh, the common themes you hear from conservative Republican candidates. And uh, that, uh, I think, right out of the gate in, in when I was a House member back in 1999, uh, with the uh, returning of surplus and, and uh, tax cuts and those things right out of the gate. And then, uh, you know, after I, I ran for the Senate, of course, I was a minority member for, uh, well, it would have been six years. And it's a whole different environment. Now you've got to figure out how to get things done as a, as a minority member. And, and I would say probably uh, legislation-wise, policy-wise, a high point would have been working on election reform issues in the uh, 2010 legislative session. That had been about a two-year in the making process, uh, working through. That was in the wake of the Coleman Frank and recount, and uh, all of the things that we we had to change, dealing with absentee ballots and, and the whole process, and and moving the primary, uh, also some campaign finance uh, laws changes, dealing with Citizens United. Uh, all of those things happened. Those there were five different bills all happened in one year, and I was the lead Republican on the committee. Worked a lot with uh, Ann Rest and over the interim uh, with a lot of other legislators pulled together a whole package of things and then I had to sell it to my caucus and she sold it to her caucus and we were able to get near unanimous support on election related bills in an election year which is really uh, unheard of but we were able to pull it off and that I think was was a policy high point and this year I've got a couple of things in the works I don't know if I'm gonna get them done by the end of the year I'm I'm the uh, chief author of the public benefit corporation bill which is a hybrid between nonprofits and for-profit corporations that's also known as the B Corp bill. So well, the B, yes, and, and this could this could unleash a lot of investment into things that uh, uh, which you know a traditional for-profit company couldn't do, and a nonprofit isn't able to do. And I think that that can really be something that's really good for for Minnesota going forward. So that's a, another policy item, and I have advanced I think a lot of awareness on occupational licensure. I think that government really abuses occupational licensure, it gets away from public purpose or public interest, and tends to be more uh, of usually to fencing out competition. We've allowed this to happen over decades, and uh, I, I'm trying to turn that around, and I've put forth uh, bills that uh, have done that, uh, and uh, um, not all have made it, but it's a policy initiative that I think I uh, drew a lot of awareness to. You're known for working across party lines. <laughs> That's for funny that you would say that. <laughs> well, you just mentioned Senator Ann Rest. You've sure. got Senator John Marty working with you on the speed yes. court bill. And as I researched a lot of your former legislation, Sen former Senator Linda Scheid, who has now passed away, she was yeah. a co-author on a lot of your legislation sure. as well. Do you credit this for getting some of your packages well, you, you know, we do two things here. Obviously, we're elected uh, because we want to affect an agenda that, that aligns with our philosophy and our beliefs. So when it comes to core principles, uh, I'm certainly an outspoken partisan. There's no question about that. Uh, I will debate you about uh, the role of government in society and taxes and, and all those sorts of things. Uh, and we'll have a very, you know, we could have a very difference of opinion, uh, like I do with, with Democrats. But then at the end of the day, you know, if you want to do some things that maybe aren't partisan in nature, well then then you need those relationships and you go forth and you, you find those those areas of common ground and then you can do some things. Not everything we do is a, is a partisan bickering. You know, I, I hear that a lot from people say, well, just stop the partisan bickering. And then what I say is, you know, one person's partisan bickering is another person's principal debate. I mean, it all depends on your perspective. And, uh, you know, it's separating those two. And uh, when you can get into the area of, uh, of common ground and say, that these, these are things that are not partisan in nature. Grab those opportunities and, and you can get things some things done. And uh, so it's, it's interesting that you would say that because I mean it's just a question of choosing when is the appropriate time to stand on principles, fight for your beliefs, uh, and when is the time to work with people and then get something done and, uh, just, and knowing the difference between those two. Do you think your per, uh, political career is on hiatus or do you think it's done? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I, I just know that right now, as I said earlier, you know when it's time to, to, to quit and, and the, uh, um, the role I'm, I'm playing now, it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating, I love doing it. 
Uh, my heart says I would love to continue on longer, but my head says you need to look at your priorities in your life and decide. And when I look at you know family and, and uh, business and politics, the bottom has to get cut right now. And uh, you know who knows down the road. Uh, I'm 47 years old. Um, so I'm not old, but I'm not young either. <laughs> and uh, who knows, uh, you know, maybe a decade from now, uh, some other opportunity would come up and, and my kids will be uh, older and, and I'll have other opportunities. And, um, and, you know, you never want to close the door. Okay, Senator, my last question for you is now sure. as you're, it's not even a question, it's an opportunity for you to provide a statement to your constituents. What would you like to say to them? Oh, well, I, I just am uh, honored and privileged. You know, I, I uh, uh, left the, uh, uh, I grew up in Apple Valley, of course, and I, and I spent some time in the Air Force. And when I left active duty and moved back to Minnesota, it was to, to run a business and to get into politics in some way. I didn't know I was going to be elected to office. I had actually worked on campaigns and I had uh, worked for other people in, and, uh, um, in the political field, and, and uh, then I had this opportunity. And just by showing up to precinct caucuses and saying, I'd like to be the candidate, and my constituent my, my, that had showed up to precinct caucuses, they said, you can be our standard bearer. You can, you can do this. And, and uh, I am so honored by that. And then, of course, you carry that to the general election. And I won six elections um, by pretty decent margins. And uh, I feel good about that personally. And uh, I also uh, I feel good that uh, the people in my district trusted me with this uh, to do what's right. Uh, uh, and I, I believe I've uh, always done what I said I was going to do, and have always been upfront. And uh, and I just appreciate their uh, willingness to send me here for the years and give me this privilege. Okay. So thank you. The legislature asked and the city answered. Minneapolis Mayor R.T. Ryback announced that the city has stepped up and now has a majority of city council members on board to build a new Viking stadium where the Metrodome currently sits. The plan includes the expansion of video pull tabs and bingo to help finance the stadium. But what comes next is still the big question. From the beginning, Council President Johnson and I were cautioning people not to put people in a yes or a no category until we actually knew what was on the table. We really only had a proposal a couple of weeks ago that was uh, negotiated with all of us. That was a good proposal for the state and for the Vikings, but it's also a good proposal for the people in Minneapolis. And our council members wanted a series of things in this. They wanted to make sure that this made financial sense. And what we're doing is expanding the, uh, or extending the hospitality tax that already exists in Minneapolis, which guarantees us funding for the convention center. And when people understood that, they recognized how important that is. It allows us the ability to address the target center issues we have, which is very important for folks. And now they understand that also leads indirectly to property tax relief. It also makes a billion dollar investment in the city of Minneapolis. And I think the more that our uh, friends in labor talk to them about who specifically that meant in their wards, when the more people recognized that this is one of the best single ways that we can to move the economy forward, it made sense. We don't have an agreement from the legislature. We don't, you know, we need, we need lots of agreements in the next couple of weeks. But again, if there's a willingness to, to make this happen, then we'll find a way to do so. I, I've been through enough of these sessions to know when people want to make something happen, they work it out. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media and House Public Information Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.